Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for, uh, it's, it's a good turnout we have today, despite the, uh, despite the snow. Um, so thanks for, uh, thanks for coming along. Uh, I'm very glad to welcome Dr. Jennifer Allen, uh, who's a postdoc at uh, Carleton University. Um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Allen properly and um, introduce the, the topic of her, uh, of her talk today, I just want to um, just briefly introduce uh, myself. So my name is, is Chris Huggins. I'm in the School of International Development and Global Studies upstairs, and I um, coordinate the, uh, the kind of brown bag series for IPEN. Uh, I want to introduce uh, uh, Ryan, who's already uh, said hi as well, uh, the, uh, taking care of the uh, logistical stuff around the food, which is the most important thing, I think. Um, but Ryan also uh, is the events coordinator for, for IPEN. Uh, and on that note, I do want to, um, like in case some of you have to leave before the end of this session today, I just wanted to mention a couple of other um, events which are, which are going on. So the first one is actually going on uh, at Carlton. Uh, it's, um, it's an event, uh, it's a presentation by Craig Murphy. Uh, it's a presentation of a draft of the introductory chapter of a book that he's working on, tentatively called Equality or Extinction. Uh, the talk is called The Five Faces of Global Equality, a modest proposal to make the world a better place for all. It sounds pretty entertaining. Um, the date is uh, February 28th, and it's a, an evening one, so it's 5.30 to 7 p.m. Uh, at Richcraft Hall in, uh, at Calvin University. Um, and that is, uh, all of our uh, events are advertised on the, uh, the SIPS um, website, right? So you can find more details of that on the SIPS website. Um, the other one coming up after that uh, is right here in, in this room. Um, Ryan Katz-Rosim will be moderating a, a panel featuring Craig Murphy again, uh, Suzanne S uh, Soderberg, Randall Germain, and Jacqueline Best. Uh, and the uh, theme of that panel is the return of illiberalism and the future of international political economy research. Uh, so again, that's March 1st, and that's a lunchtime uh, session, 12 to 1.30 p.m on March 1st. And again, if you want more details, they're there on the uh, SIPS uh, website. Welcome. Um, so, uh, this is uh, going to be uh, essentially um, uh, an English language uh, event, but I think we are um, at, uh, at University of Ottawa, which is a bilingual institution. Donc, je vais parler un peu en français, juste pour faire un résumé ou un sommaire de, de la présentation, tout d'abord. Um, selon Professor uh, Allen, or Dr. Uh, Jennifer Allen, the concept des services um, écosystémiques a pris de, de l'importance dans le réseau international de l'élaboration des politiques en tant que mécanisme de développement durable et est devenu un ressourci pour les efforts visant à évaluer la contribution de la nature au bien-être humain, généralement en termes économiques. Cette euh, présentation retrace l'histoire et l'évolution des acteurs qui façonnent et diffusent le concept des services écosystémiques, euh, SI. Malgré le potentiel de nouvelles formes de capitalisme à euh, triple bilan ou triple indice de rentabilité, le secteur privé est presque totalement absent, les organisations internationales continuant à dominer l'espace politique. Étonnamment, malgré sa maturité apparente en tant qu'instrument de politique internationale, une grande partie des activités de SE passées, présentes et futures reste axée sur le renforcement des capacités plutôt que sur la valorisation et le paiement des services de la nature. En conséquence, le SE demeure faible en tout que concept politique visant à encourager l'utilisation durable du capital naturel et sujet au alias déf, euh, définitionnel, ça pense en utilisation pratique en tant que modèle alternatif à la rentabilité unique de la maximisation de profit. Um, so, just to uh, finish my introduction by mentioning that, as I said, Professor uh, Dr. Allen is a postdoctoral fellow at Carleton University. She received her PhD from the University of BC uh, in, uh, in May last year. Uh, her research explores the motivations and strategies of non-state actors in global environmental governance and the conditions under which these strategies can lead to institutional change. Um, there's a very interesting uh, project she's working on called the Value of Nature Project. There's a hyperlink if you click on the, uh, the advert, which is on the SIPS website. Uh, and under this project, 
She studies the evolution and diffusion of the ecosystem services concept and the implications for environmental conservation. She's already published in Third World Quarterly and Environmental Politics Journal, as well as uh, sending uh, over 100 Earth Negotiation Bulletins from nearly 30 UN environmental conferences. So after that rather lengthy introduction, welcome uh, Dr. Allen. Thank you. I'll stand because I'm short, so there might not be a big difference. Um, <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, thank you Chris for organizing it and Ryan. Um, this is actually a great opportunity that I'm very uh, thankful for because this is one of those sort of perennial works in projects, uh, works in progress as part of a larger project. So this is a, a really excellent opportunity to get some feedback and uh, be able to bounce some ideas off of some people. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to start by quickly introducing that larger value of nature project and sort of the why we're doing this uh, motivating questions before quickly laying the land of ecosystem services, what it is, uh, and giving a brief history. And then talking about sort of the promise juxtaposed with the reality of what we see happening globally on this idea of ecosystem services. And, uh, you know, we can have a conversation whether it's too early to ring the bell and, and say there's the decline or even the death of ecosystem services, uh, but we can, that's something that we're potentially looking at in the project is, is what does the future hold and how does this potentially help conservation on the ground and livelihoods for people that protect conser uh, conserve nature. So the Valuing Nature Project is a large project. Uh, unfortunately, Graham Alls couldn't be here, and all difficult questions were going to go to him. Uh, but there's four universities and about five professors involved, and then there's three or four of us postdocs. And there's three work packages that are all motivated by the same idea, that this idea of ecosystem services or putting a value on nature or a value on conservation has largely been the domain of economists and ecologists and ecological economists, uh, but political scientists, other than sort of work on carbon markets, haven't really dug in. So what we're looking at through these three work packages that are looking at different levels is what are sort of the power and questions of legitimacy and accountability and authority around efforts to put a value on nature. So the first work project or work package looks at ontologies, so how do we think about the value that we put on nature, or what types of services or what types of things in nature do we put values on. Uh, then the international level, which is where I'm going to focus today, is looking at the broad trends. So even a taking stock of what's happening globally on all of these efforts to put a value or to commodify nature. And then another part of it is looking at what actors have been learning over the years. You know, this has been going on for decades now. Has practice changed? Has there been efforts to learn? And then there's a series of national case studies, one of which will be Canada, uh, to look at uptake at the national level. To what extent is there efforts to value nature been mainstream into policy and practice? And really trying to get on the ground and ask, does this work? Uh, so I don't have the does it work answer yet. Uh, I'm, I'll focus on that international part. So broadly speaking, Ecosystem services is the, or are the benefits that people obtain from ecosystems. Uh, we could talk about their role in supporting uh, life through providing food or uh, you know, drugs for medicines. We could talk about building resilience to extreme weather events, regulating the climate, cleaning our water, or the aesthetic benefits. So ecotourism, for example, relies on ecosystem services because people want to trek through jungles that are beautiful. So there's a value that you can put on the aesthetic beauty of a landscape that ecotourism operations rely upon. And so all of these different forms of ecosystem services have an intrinsic component, you know, nature matters for nature's sake and an intrinsic value to us. But increasingly, <coughs> all of these services that we're thinking of also have a monetary or an economic value component. And the tension between the two really runs across this area. Now I said part of our, our project is looking at reflexivity and learning, because this idea isn't exactly new. Uh, you know, the idea of putting money on things that nature provides is, has been around for quite some time. 
and internationally, if you're looking at it, uh, sort of the early 90s uh, and, and early 2000s, and we really see international policymakers and circles start to take this idea up. Uh, in the early 90s, there were a lot of national level and bilateral payment for ecosystem services, or PEZ programs. Uh, Costa Rica, for example, has a famous one where they protected a national forest. Uh, in New York, there's a quite well-known one to protect a watershed, so the drinking water for New York actually doesn't go through a whole bunch of machines. It goes through a well-managed ecosystem that uh, the watershed has been protected by paying people to protect it. Uh, you know, Nestle Vittel has a deal with about 20 farmers to make sure that our bottled water is very clean. Uh, so there, there was a lot of enthusiasm for the potential of putting a value on these services because it makes the service or it makes the ecosystem worth as much economically when it's pristine as when you mow it over, cut it down, change it in some irreversible way. And so in the early, 2000, early 90s, early 2000s, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the potential of this valuation exercise to pay people for these services. And so the policy circles internationally started to take this up. And in the early 2000s, there was this, or mid 2000s, I guess, uh, there was this Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And this had some really big hitters behind it. UN Environment Program, UN Development Program, uh, the Secretariats for the Convention on Biological Diversity, Desertification, Wetlands, uh, any sort of any international organization that you would think would be related to this was somehow tied on, and a lot of the big NGOs as well. And what it did was do a global taking stock of the state of the world's ecosystems, and then use the idea of ecosystem services to tie the, the quality of those ecosystems to human well-being, and specifically looking at it in terms of poverty alleviation and other efforts. So the mid-2000s, there was more and more uh, uptake on it, and uh, you know the G20 was starting to commission these stock takes at a national level around economically valuing ecosystem services. There were more and more global funds being put up to pay for some of these services, and in 2010, it, through the Convention on Biological Diversity, there started to be agreements and targets set through the Aichi targets, through various other initiatives. The World Bank started to talk about the changing wealth of nations by including the economic value of these services. Uh, and then 2012, you know, there's more statements around the, the outcome document at the Rio Plus 20 conference on the future we want. And in 2012, you also started to see corporations uh, put together, you know, the Natural Capital Coalition, which is WWF with some corporations and some private investors, uh, and other sort of public, private, and corporate entities starting to use this idea of how can they value, you know, how can Coca-Cola put a value on all of the water that it takes slash steals from people. Um, so this is, this is what started to happen more recently, and, and the Sustainable Development Goals mentions ecosystem services in uh, the life on land goal, I think it's number 15. Uh, so there, there was sort of the, so there has been sort of a continuation of mentioning ecosystem services in policy circles, but not a lot of effort to really tangibly move this forward. Uh, and also what you see throughout this sort of brief history is the declining enthusiasm for payments for ecosystem services, these sort of PEZ programs. So despite, you know, back here, these early global uh, efforts to set up funds or to set up big projects for payments for ecosystem services, it never really got too far past the national, subnational, and bilateral levels. Uh, you know, for the entire first 20 years of the Global Environment Facility, that big financial arm of environmental agreements, they've only had 54 projects that include payments for ecosystem services. Only 25% of those actually had payments for ecosystem services as the main part of it. And most of those were capacity building efforts. So over time, you see some of the enthusiasm go down. You see a late arrival by corporate <coughs> actors 
And you also see a bit of a winnowing of ecosystem services being most closely associated with managing land and with biodiversity, and less so with some other areas such as forests, or you know, even in the climate world where you would expect to see it, like uh, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. Uh, they don't actually explicitly use the terms ecosystem services, even though they're paying people to pursue the forest to suck up carbon. Like, that is a pet's project, but they're explicitly staying away from those words. Um, so that's, that's sort of the brief history and sort of the out, broad outline of trends. Is this a good time to break for? Yeah. Why don't, why don't we wait till your talk is done and then we can okay. take, grab a sandwich while we ask questions. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to ask if we should take a photo. No, no, no. That's, that's yeah. dangerous. <laughs> Let's keep going. Okay. Um, and so because we saw sort of different actors coming in at different times and we saw ecosystem services being used in the context of biodiversity and water and climate adaptation and forests and, you know, across these areas, we thought, okay, we need to map what this looks like and get stock of internationally who's doing what. So we have created this database of about, well exactly, so far 336 initiatives. And so our unit of analysis is an activity or an initiative that is working on ecosystem services. Uh, so then from there for each one of these, and I should say we also limited it to something that's multilateral or international. So we don't have anything bilateral uh, because that would just get a little bit out of hand. Uh, and we also don't include anything that's national or subnational. So caveats abound, uh, which I'm happy to chat about later. Uh, but for each one of these initiatives, we cataloged four things, mainly. Uh, actor type, is an NGO, is it an I, <coughs> an international organization, you know, who's doing this? Uh, activity type, is it an agreement, like the IEG targets to preserve and enhance ecosystem services by X percent by 2020? Uh, is it knowledge, so research? Uh, is it an initiative, so some sort of you know, effort that ha will have tangible benefits like a project or a program of work? Uh, or is it material resources? Are we providing money here? Uh, we looked at the type of authority backstopping this initiative. Is it state, non-state, or some mix? And then we try to capture the theme of what this initiative or this, this activity is doing uh, uh, in terms of, you know, is it trying to economically value services? Is it a payment for ecosystem services program, an offset scheme, capacity building, or are they kind of just throwing the word around as a rhetorical general policy tool? Uh, so that was, that was our cut at it. Uh, so as I said, there's 360 or 336 now, and I think we have about 20 more to go because someone braved the depths of the FAO database. Um, now, this isn't what I thought uh, expected, I expected to see. Because of this early enthusiasm for PEZ, I thought, you know, we'd have payment schemes going, offset schemes abound, um, and I think that's about the time I agreed to do this talk to the International Political Economy Network thinking, I'll t talk about offset schemes for a little while, it'll be great. Uh, and instead, we see over 55% of all of these are for capacity building. And it doesn't matter, you know, this is a snapshot of all of them. Even when we look over time, uh, there's as much activity happening to do capacity building today as there was in 1990 or even 1980s. Uh, so that's, that's static across time. Uh, surprisingly little on the economic valuation side of things, uh, especially given that that's sort of the, the rationale that a lot of people will use, is that if we tell policymakers that preserving this green belt area will save them $50 million in health and water and all of these, then that builds the business case for conservation. And that's often the, the language used about valuing nature, but then there's very little work actually figuring out how to do this economic valuation. So this is, this, you know, research is fun because we find new things. Uh, this has raised a lot of questions for us. So why is it that the ecosystem services regime or regime complex, you know, the world of ecosystem services is essentially stunted at this capacity building stage? Why is it that this promise of the, the power of using economic language hasn't led to 
looking at things economically or even progressing to payments. Uh, and so we've, we've been trying to tease this out. And the first cut, we thought, well, let's look at who's doing this. You know, let's look at who's doing all this capacity building. And so for all of our database, these are the actors that, are, that have undertaken ecosystem services projects. And so international organizations, perhaps unsurprisingly, are pretty big. They've been there since the beginning. They've <coughs> always been central actors to this. And 23% of the initiatives in our database are being done by international organizations. Uh, the NGO slice is quite small, 8%. Uh, it, it also, that confused me, because I expected to see WWF as a very business-minded NGO that also has a budget somewhere in the size of some UN agencies uh, would be active. And their national chapters do a lot, but at the global level, not really so much. Um, the other surprising thing is all these partnerships. So not a, I, I would expect a partnership either among international organizations, and international organizations are involved in a lot of these partnerships, by far the majority of them, uh, I would expect partnerships to be prevalent if these were big programs of work. You know, a big chunk, you need political will, material resources, you need to leverage the ability of multiple organizations to get through. But a lot of these projects are small. You know, it's capacity building. It's working in four pilot countries to, you know, value, to work with communities and value their services uh, that they derive from nature. And yet, they're being undertaken by in partnerships. So groups of international organizations are a lot of them. Some of them are NGOs working with international organizations. There's a couple that are businesses and NGOs. Uh, but the partnerships fit is, is quite interesting. And so that's, that's right now what we're really digging into. And then if you look at the authority sitting behind these, because of these partnerships, there's this hybrid authority. So it's not the state backing these initiatives, and it's not really non-state actors acting sort of private authority. It's this hybrid type of authority that are behind a lot of the ecosystem services regime. So we thought, okay, well, let's see who's doing what. And so I know you're not supposed to do lots of numbers on the slide, but I did. Um, in terms of, so there's a few interesting things I'll just quickly highlight. Everybody, mostly what they do is capacity building. So that's partly what's driving that big number. Uh, but then if you look over at this payment scheme and those offset schemes, the interesting thing is NGOs are doing a ton of the payment schemes. So you have sort of this space where you're trying to experiment or where you're trying to make these markets, and that's really being done by the private actors, the NGOs, or the donor organizations that are interested in this more than the international organizations. Uh, so when we look at what these international organizations are doing, you know, they're a huge chunk of the regime in general. A lot of what they're doing is this capacity building, and then you know, rule making. So that's the Convention on Biological Diversity or the Ramsar Wetlands Convention, setting rules around how we're going to value nature. But you take away that interstate negotiation rule making bit, and you're really left with this capacity building. Is what IOs are actively trying to do. And so we're, we're trying to think about this now in terms of what are the limits to market making? There is all this excitement around making these markets to value nature that hasn't been realized. So uh, we have sort of three strands of thinking, which uh, at the moment, especially because the ISA deadline for conference papers is due soon, um, we're hotly debating. So. All of this is now the exploratory speculative part of the presentation, which I'm very interested to see what you think about. The first is that we think what's going on, or one of the things that's going on, is IOs are crowding out innovation. International organizations are constrained by states and what states want them to do. You know, there's wiggle room there. There is, there are ways that international organizations act independently from state demands. But largely, they still have to do what states would be okay with, or else they get their knuckles wrapped, like at the last uh, UN Environment Assembly meeting. And so 
they by nature have to be very conservative. And moving into the area of markets, as much as you know, putting a price on nature is quite what we think sort of an economically conservative idea. Uh, that's not necessarily something that they're willing to do because it has a high risk of failure. Capacity building on the other side is very much a state demand. Developing countries absolutely want technology transfer and capacity building. So this is an area that IOs can excel in. Uh, and these IOs have been then the international ecosystem service space for the very beginning, or since the very beginning. And since then, they're still central. So if you think about it, you know, like a network and network theory, some of our early social network analyses that we're doing has UNDP, UNEP, FAO sitting right at the center as these highly connected actors that really can diffuse their version of what ecosystem services is and kind of set this expectation or this norm that ecosystem services work is constituted by capacity building. That's just what you do in this space. Um, diffusion arguments are really tough to prove, of course. Uh, we started looking over time, so even, even corporations, you know, this natural capital coalition that sprung up, they're referencing the work of the IOs quite extensively, and they're all developing another toolkit to help you value the ecosystem services for your bottom line. Uh, so they're also doing capacity building. <coughs> And the other way that, that IOs are maybe crowding out other actors that might have some innovative ideas or be willing to take the risk for a market is they act as implementing agencies. So again, constrained by state demands, they do what states tell them. Uh, and they also do what states tell other international organizations to do. So those 54 PEZ projects that the Global Environment Facility has done over a 20 year period Almost all of them, with the exception of uh, maybe four, have gone to big UN, you know, UNDP and UNEP, as the implementing agency for that activity. So the only ones that weren't really hardcore capacity building uh, were actually done by WWF and some of the NGOs uh, in, in terms of getting Jeff money. A second line we're thinking about, this is sort of the more um, contentious one at the time, at right now amongst <coughs> us, is that maybe market making requires states, uh, that we can't leave it to international organizations or NGOs. Uh, you need the backstop of a state. States are market makers. Uh, there's some evidence of this in the climate world. If you look at, you know, the clean development mechanism was set up by interstate negotiation, uh, joint joint implementation, red, things like that are, have been made by states. There's also evidence in the climate world of private authority or <coughs> private actors working in this area exclusively or ex uh, explicitly referencing the mechanisms under the Kyoto Protocol when they're doing their own disclosures or when they're doing their own internal accounting. So that sort of coral reef <coughs> argument that states make the market and then all the little fishies come. Uh, there might be some benefits if you want to market. Uh, there's longer time horizons. Even international organizations have funding cycles and shorter time horizons that they work under, generally about five years. Uh, the state could backstop in case of failure. Uh, and you might get buy-in for states. So you know, developing countries and some developed countries aren't super keen about international NGOs showing up and bypassing the national government and working with local communities and giving them alternative sources of income, uh, particularly where maybe land tenure isn't so secure. Uh, so if you have state authority behind this market, states interact with states and get their buy a little easier. And the last one is that, you know, I mentioned that this is in water and biodiversity and climate and wetlands and oceans and marine pollution. Uh, so it's across different regimes and there's different forums in which these actors are working. And that itself, we think, is a limit on market making potential. It diffuses authority, diffuses accountability. You could set up a wonderful <coughs> wetlands off offset scheme in the Ramsar world of wetlands conservation with those actors. Now, if the biodiversity or even climate world says, 
we actually don't want to have those rules or we want slightly different rules. Now countries and individual actors can pick and choose which rules they want to go to. Sort of a forum shopping type of idea. Uh, it's also difficult if you want to start getting momentum for this. You can't just go to biodiversity. Maybe you have to jump into multiple forums and convince a lot of different actors. Uh, there's also, we think, sort of a case of wheel reinvention happening. Um, I sat in on all the negotiations for RED from uh, 2012 or 2011 until 2013 when it was adopted. And there wasn't a poorest person in the room. They were all climate people. So uh, much to the chagrin of me as the only forest person, uh, they were reinventing the wheel. So they were doing ecosystem services and doing a payment for ecosystem system services like thing. Uh, no one knew what that meant. No one had, had experience in a PEZ project. Uh, I think one guy from Costa Rica showed up at some point. Um, and so nobody, you know, you have to reinvent the reel every single time you want to do this. And so if you're looking at coming up with some big global market, that's really tough to do if you have multiple forums working on different issues and people that don't necessarily cross those forums. So looking ahead, you know, our database uh, marks when these projects start or activities start. It marks when they end or when they're scheduled to end. And so if we start setting that at sort of 2019, 2020, 2025, we're not seeing a lot happen. That could just be because stuff's not on the books yet. That's possible. Uh, but we're also seeing major actors like IUCN, uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, huge global organization. Uh, they're no longer using the idea of ecosystem services. Now they're using nature-based solutions, which when you ask them what it means, kind of means ecosystem services, uh, improving people's well-being by protecting nature, that nature provides goods and services to people. Uh, but this now has a PEZ connotation, a connotation of economic valuation, and so that's something that they want to get away from. So they want to continue to use rhetorical tools to help people think about nature and human interaction and how nature helps human well-being, but they don't necessarily want the baggage of this. Uh, also, you know, green economy language is kind of there, but starting to dwindle. And so we're starting to wonder if it's already a decline of this idea of valuing nature economically, given the limited uptake that we've seen and the limited sort of market-making ability that's actually been realized on the ground. Uh, so with that happy note, uh, I will finish here and, and thank you all very much. And uh, definitely I will not stand in the way of food. <laughs> So uh, thanks very much, uh, Jen. I I'm sure you all agree that was a um, presentation uh, that uh, gives us a lot to talk about. Uh, I think both in terms of the uh, maybe the surprising um, kind of conclusions that you've you've made, but also the fact that within your team you're still kind of working out some of the analyses and some of the, um, the, the findings there. And I think. Um, Conceptually, you raise a lot of issues, uh, which from an academic point of view, uh, many of us could, could talk about, right? Um, environmental services as a regime, you mentioned uh, network theory, uh, you had some really, um, really well laid out conceptual uh, pieces, which you've worked on in your, in your project and are still kind of uh, chewing over. So I think got lots of, lots of material for us to, uh, to talk about. But I think it's a good time to take a break and get some food before we get into the well, questions, why don't we right? Why don't we pass around a piece of sandwich butter? Okay. It's so like lead into an informal uh, discussion uh, period. Okay. You so gra grab a sandwich and ask a question. Let's, let's that. Yeah. So. Is one necessary for the other? <laughs> yes. um, so James, you feel free to take questions as you uh, as you want them. Or? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's fine. So thank you. Go. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Etienne Azna. I work for CIRAD. Uh, agriculture research organization. I was. I have a question about. You, you haven't mentioned the word agriculture, mm -hmm. and agriculture covers forty percent of the emerged land of the world, mm -hmm. the ocean, but uh, and and provide a, a livelihood for forty-five percent of the people in the world. So, 
At the same time, uh, ecosystem services is a, is a concept that we use a lot in agricultural transformation, and agroecology is based on the, the enhancing the ecosystem services not only for production but also for other other services. So, uh, and you, my question is that did you compute in your database the newest programs about uh, agricultural transformation enhancing ecosystem services? I just mentioned one because it's a very, it's a worldwide initiative. It's about the four thousand initiative that gather, I think, around one thousand members now, member states, institutions, about convincing that agriculture is able to capture carbon from the atmosphere, and if it captures four thousand um, of carbon, it can recapture the whole amount of carbon emitted since the industrial revolution. So it's a huge uh, services that agriculture can provide. My question is, how come agriculture is not on the radar of these ecosystem services more? From your point of view, at the Paris negotiation, agriculture was not very much involved, whereas it's a, it's a key uh, aspect of ecosystem services. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot there, and I'll make sure maybe afterwards to get the exact name of that initiative, just so I can, I'm very paranoid about this and making sure that we have everything, so that would be great. Uh, the FAO has been doing a lot on ecosystem services in agriculture, uh, far more than anyone else. Uh, it's been interesting that they've been narrowing it down to specific services, so they've been doing a lot on pollination, for example, or soil fertility, uh, soil retention, things like that, because of exactly this uh, potential to sequester carbon. Um, it's just agriculture is so difficult at the global level, you know, for climate. I'm sure the land for climate. So uh, agriculture negotiations there have been stuck for solid 12 years, and uh, now they're very excited because they've agreed to workshops that will talk about certain limited number of topics for the next two years, and that's progress uh, in the climate world on agriculture, at least in terms of state negotiations. Um, nationally, we do see more happening on agriculture, and there's more interest, and climate smart agriculture through the FAO, through um, the consultative group of international agricultural researchers. CG, CG, yes, yeah. okay. uh, They've been doing a lot of work on this, uh, but it seems to be an area where a few organizations are really specializing, and it hasn't spread out to be sort of a common ecosystem services understanding, like we think about biodiversity or something like that. And so there does seem to be this this stop uh, to it diffusing more more, more broadly. Um, but yeah, I would like to write down specifically that. Uh, my my hypothesis. Is, is going beyond what you said, is the fact that the history of, of, of people for the two last centuries is splitting nature and uh, agriculture. Mm -hmm. And the, the big change of paradigm is considering agriculture as part of nature. Agriculture uh, is the steward of nature, in a sense. And it's the, the big debate between land sparing and land sharing. But I think agriculture world, you, you mean specialized institutions like FAO or CG, are now ready to, to jump into the fact that agriculture is part of nature, completely part of nature. So ecosystem services is a, a complete part of agriculture services to production. Yeah, that would really require sort of a mind shift in how they've been thinking about things like industrialization of the sector. Yeah, you can, you can uh, talk to you. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. Yes, hi there. Thank you. Uh, Henry, I work at Environment and Climate Change Canada with my colleague, uh, and we heard what you talk, so thrilled. This is very uh, current for us um, and what we're doing in the strategic policy shop. We're trying to stitch together a lot of what the department is doing, uh, and there's bits of, of ecosystem services happening throughout the department, um, whether that uh, might be in things like environmental assessments, or just the, the really sort of narrow uh, evaluation side of things, as well as in our uh, Canadian Wilderness Service uh, group that, that handle the protected areas. 
And so what we're trying to we sort of in task to do is kind of think about what the what the next step is. Uh, the, the slide that you're that is behind you says the decline of ecosystem services. So yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> that that might indicate to me uh, sort of I guess my 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 my, my first question is, is is what if we could go beyond that might be the future of this? Is it is it just a case of it, we're going to slowly move forward with these concepts, but they're going to be repackaged and rebranded, as you sort of hinted at, that there's, for whatever reason, uh, public opinion research doesn't like the tying nature to economics. Is that the future, or is it um, really that we need to rethink on, on, on concepts? Uh, so that would be sort of, I guess, one question. And the other thing, again, staying within sort of the policy world, we live in is um, in the future. What's the the biggest value for ecosystem services? Would it be maybe to reform some of the existing tools that we have? So our park creation is a big deal, in Canada. Uh, we certainly value those. And I, I certainly see a, a big role in, in this approach to sort of helping us do our existing toolkits, which tend to be on the more safeguarding ring fencing nature, or is this, and this is where I got excited being, it's a very new concept for me, I find it very fascinating, is perhaps there's something in this, uh, and then maybe you've seen it internationally since you've dipped into how other people are using this, as a way to rethink a different way of approaching nature, so instead of ring fencing it continually, if we just maybe, and I'm, I'm going to steal from the, the sort of the ACHI strategic goals, they, they also play in the area of looking at the underlying causes, and slowing the decline, which is, these are different sandboxes than just the ring fencing, and I'm thinking, it seems like ecosystem services, or whatever it's called, would, could, would play to those kinds of, uh, of roots, so that maybe we just all conceptualize nature a little bit differently, so. I know there's a lot there, that it's very exciting what you're doing, I, that's the, the most notes I've taken in a long time, so, so thank you for that. My students say the same. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there, there is a lot there, and, and Canada's actually gone about this in a very interesting bottom-up, like the Canadian Values Survey and things like that, which I think is quite unique. Um, often it's more top-down. We've done an economic or a ecological survey that's determined these are the main services. So that, that bottom-up process actually is quite unique uh, that Canada has done. Um, and the toolkit that was just released, I think, uh, in March, uh, people are quite excited about it. Um, I mean, the, the decline, I think, no one no one would dispute or really take issue with the idea behind this, that nature is essential for human well-being. And I think the fact that that, that that idea has this sort of taken for granted quality often now is a big win. I think that that's a huge win that, I, that we underestimate when we talk about ecosystem services, that you know, now viewing people as part of nature is much more common than it was 20 years ago. Uh, whether or not we then stick a dollar sign on this and say, great, now here's $20 million that, you know, can be averted, um, is a separate conversation from that motivating idea, as you say, about how we think about nature. Um, in Canada, there is still efforts to try to use the language of monetization to help affect policy decisions. And I haven't, I don't have a sense yet if it works, uh, but there actually seems like there's more of a, you know, inclination towards or a, recep a reception of that idea in Canada than in other places. Uh, in the in developing countries, uh, FAO and UNDP just keep saying, you know, in some of our interviews have been saying, we've noticed two things. One, payment for ecosystem services is essentially a public subsidy, it's not a market. And two, uh, we keep saying this and, you know, valuing the ecosystem service and policymakers keep saying, that's nice, the Minister of Finance will never listen to me. Um, so that's like the two main lessons sort of from our initial uh, survey of this nationally. Uh, in Canada, you know, we had the, the Green Belt, the Ontario Green Belt, very much used sort of economic language. This is how much this is worth if you don't sell it off to developers, things like that. Um, I know David Suzuki Foundation is using this type of language on Site C and a few other sort of big policy decisions that are coming. Uh, it's kind of an open question whether or not it works here. 
uh, the main thing is working from a policy perspective, working across those silos. So if, if moving beyond ring fencing and uh, expanding the park system, will have a service where it cleans the air, which reduces asthma. That's a real tangible, monetizable health benefit to our public system. But that's also three departments that need to be involved in that. You need health, you need finance, and you need environment, and all, all on board. Uh, so that's, that's one of the biggest challenges, is working, it's a challenge for anything environmental, but uh, or policy related, but working across those silos is really difficult in this area. Uh, if you're going to use monetizing service provision type of language, then you really are building a business case, which then immediately evokes the Minister of Finance. Um, and so that's, that's one of the big policy challenges. And I think maybe that's part of the reason why we're seeing the idea of the connection between humans and nature and that nature is essential for human well-being repackaged into new terms like ecosystem-based adaptation in the climate world uh, or nature-based solutions at a broad level. Because this idea is quite well accepted, it's just that that monetization bit hasn't taken off like people thought it would. I want to make sure, talking of um, distribution of benefits and things, and everyone's getting some sandwiches, so please don't be shy. Let's pass them around. I don't know if... Uh, this, uh, this can go on over the side a bit, a bit more there. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> but I see uh, some, yeah, please go ahead. I really enjoyed the talk, and I think it's, it's provoking a really interesting, um, or has the potential to provoke some really interesting discussion. I guess I'm a little bit puzzled by the fact that you're focusing on the international, because ecosystem services are, maybe with the exception of climate change, are primarily local or regional kinds of benefits. And so I would, I would expect, sort of a priori, that if you're actually seeing projects on the ground that's being implemented, that it would be at the national or even local or municipal kind of level. And I think, based on what I know of the Canadian context and what I know of the US context, that's in fact what's happening, is that you're seeing those payment for ecosystem services projects being implemented at the local level, where there, it's clear, and I think one of the key reasons for that is the, the this whole issue of property rights, is that you need to be able to say who's getting a benefit, what's their current stake in that particular chunk of land, or um, and to be able to make a connection between those two sets of actors. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a great analysis, and, and maybe that is sort of one of the reasons why you know, this limits to market making, making why isn't this taking off, is just the mismatch of scale uh, might absolutely be at the heart of this. We did look regionally, um, you know, there were sort of three or four countries in a region, say the Amazon or the Congo Basin, sort of likely suspects. Um, we didn't find a ton, which was a bit surprising. Uh, but again, we, we actually are still thinking maybe we'll do this for wetlands and watersheds that cross borders and, and maybe that might work. Um, but again, I think this might be our next work package. Uh, our national case studies will be in Indonesia, India, Argentina, Canada, and the UK. Uh, so we're thinking that's our opportunity then to look at the local level and see if that's, if that's working. And then a huge challenge will be trying to tie those scales together at the very end of this project, which I have no answers for yet. Yeah, I mean, the, the Canadian situation is a good one because it's mm -hmm. it's Great. the provincial That's provincial right. governments that largely control the natural resources, mm -hmm. um, have a lot of responsibilities for water management, um, have a lot of responsibilities for wildlife management, are directly implicated in managing managing agricultural programs, for example. Mm -hmm. So it would be at, even at the subnational and, and finer scale. Yeah, it's been interesting to see. I've, I've just started the Canadian case study a little bit, and uptake across provinces is pretty uneven. Uh, some provinces are really keen, others are a bit more difficult to convince. Uh, so that's a really interesting question. That that's one of the areas I want to explore in the Canadian case study is why are some provinces really willing to latch on to this, and, and others far less so.
Yeah, go ahead. Oh, this yeah. is me. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, just building on that, um, my experience with ecosystem services is in my research on impact assessments, and which is, again, at a very local mm -hmm. level. And it just, the question that I wrote down here was, is the international or the multilateral for uh, the place, not where innovation happens, but where the good ideas get formalized? And I guess that would be interesting for you to think about moving forward. Yeah, yeah, I think that's certainly a case is that this went local to global and maybe that was sort of a codification or formalization at that level. Uh, we haven't really seen the international actors then be able to take that and bring it back to national. Mm -hmm. you know, UNDP just keeps <coughs> being your head against the wall, frankly. Um, it, it's sort of a running joke now that whenever you know the latest publication from UNDP comes out about ecosystem services, within the first page it'll be like, despite the limited uptake of this idea, here's another toolkit and we're going to help. Uh, so it's it's sort of our running joke right now that we have another toolkit uh, for developing countries to look at this in the context of pollination or desertification. Um, so it's it's interesting to see that. It was formalized, as you put it, but then back at the local level hasn't benefited maybe from that formalization. But I think it's interesting because I think that there's a lot of potential for getting this out there at an international level through impact assessments and best mm -hmm. practices in that area because you are really assessing, well, what is the impact of X project here and then how are you going to be appropriately compensating communities or whoever for what those impacts are and if if you like it really sounds like you want to be moving towards a compensation type scheme and I think that like rather than setting up markets that's kind of a place where it's already <coughs> happening so it's just weird that we're not seeing any like it didn't really show up in your research that there is any big formal <coughs> in the works in that area. Yeah I mean that might be because impact assessments vary nationally in terms of jurisdiction and what counts and what doesn't. Um, I think there is the UN statistics, there's another like letter in the acronym that I'm not remembering, yeah. uh, that is trying to standardize some of this. There's like um, an international association for impact assessments and yeah. they, they've got like a journal and it's pretty active but mm -hmm. there's nothing compelling governments or companies or anyone to adopt certain standards. It's just, if you want to be legit, <coughs> you might want to consider, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like there's a lot of supply for these ideas, yeah. and then just the demand doesn't seem to be mm -hmm. there in any sort of formal way. Yeah. Josh? Yeah. Thanks for a really interesting talk. I'm really glad that I haven't seen a lot of ecosystem services talk of late, so I have a few students working on this, but uh, I'm Josh Ramish. I'm uh, in the School of International Law and Real Estate. Um, my question was going to be about unpacking what you referred to as sort of the surprise that there was so much attention mm -hmm. on capacity building. We've got a doctoral student who's really interested in capacity building, uh, and we've been sort of pushing to say, well, I mean, obviously this isn't an end in itself. It's, it's an instrument. It's something to do that. And you've alluded to the constant development of these toolkits. Um, I think part from my angle, I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear you sort of unpack what sorts of things are going on because my speculation would be, having been involved in the Millennium uh, Ecosystem Assessment, part of what's at stake is sort of the contentious nature of what constitutes us an ecosystem service or not. And so you didn't break it down, but I mean, things like biodiversity, Red Plus, you alluded to, mm -hmm. but I mean, even up to things like landscape beauty or spiritual mm -hmm. value, things that are much less tangible than, say, you know, base flow of, of rivers, or, you know, the water, the recharge function uh, that forest cover may or may not provide. Um, but some of these are directly in contradiction. You know, we were looking at, so I was part of it from the soil biology uh, context. We were looking at below ground biodiversity, something that most people didn't even think existed. I had no idea how to quantify. Is this, again, going back to sort of the promise of these early papers like Costanza and them saying, you know, there's this whole secret economy that we, ha we need to tap into or at least should be aware of. Mm -hmm. And so I think, so there's, there's multiple things going on that there's sort of the contentious nature of what are these e ecosystems and being able to establish, you separated out rulemaking, but to me rulemaking is actually 
one of the biggest things that capacity building needs to be established. We need to say, do we have the right actors at the table? Are they putting the same value on it? Because otherwise, you end up in a market, if it's going to be a market, sort of like fair trade, where you say, well, we're just going to pay you better than the marketplace. We'll give you a market floor. And then every time, you know, the world price of something goes down, well, we know that carbon or, you know, aquifer recharge or biodiversity or pollinator function is worth some other value that the real market isn't giving. But we're just going to give you some extra money on top of that. And so from a market standpoint, it's a, it's a ratchet. Like, you're never going to go around and ask people who are burning charcoal in the Congo Basin, you know, not only have you destroyed your forest, but you also owe the international community several <laughs> billion dollars because you've, you've destroyed a, a very valuable global resource. So it's, it's a ratchet that goes up. So that, again, to try and say we're getting money to make a market, it, the, the, the capacity building I think is a lot about establishing the knowledge to assess and decide what constitutes nature-based <laughs> adaptation or uh, ecosystem services. So I'd be very interested to see how you sort of teased apart what those capacities were being built for, or whether it is just the sort of the, the dynamic of five-year projects that, you know, we ended up spending a whole lot of time just developing instruments to say, a date, you know, a, 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 a certain amount of standing biomass equals this much value for the world, and, and we could only get that far, and we couldn't say anything about the animals that live on it or anything else that happened beyond it. And so you're just sort of stuck with these five-year projects that, that are just developing instruments and never going any further than that because it's so contentious. I'd say the other thing that you didn't maybe bring out as much, but most of the emphasis in my experience is this is in places where the regimes, other aspects of the rule of law, are very, un, they're very indeterminate. And so we don't see in a Canadian, you know, maybe Red Plus should be a global thing, but it would be a lot easier to implement it in Canada than it is in Indonesia or the DR Congo. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot there. I just was curious, you know, in terms of where you're going, your, your chart added up to 100, so there was, you know, it was discreet to yeah. say, you know, rulemaking was very, very different from, from capacity building. So I just wanted to know more about where that was going. Yeah, and, and part of that was sort of a methods choice when we started off that we thought, okay, we have one poor coder who thank the <coughs> um, working on this, and how much are we going to ask of this human? Uh, and actually, we weren't sure how much we were going to find, so we were also really worried about slicing the data too many to ways. Um, and, and, you know, I think there's also a relationship, as you say, between rulemaking and capacity building in that if the, I'll just say Convention on Biological Diversity says we're going to do X and we'll support developing countries in order to meet this obligation. Because one of the big facets of rulemaking at the international level is sending signals and setting expectations that then part of the purpose of develop, of capacity building is to help developing countries meet those expectations or to set them or to reach those those goals. Um, so there's definitely a relationship between those two, which I think maybe we'll have to do a better job at kind of really sorting out how much of this capacity building line is actually in fulfillment of that rule making function. Because if that's my sense is some of what international organizations are doing for capacity building is to support those big rule making functions. And so we might have kind of created a bit of a loop there in the data. Um, my sense of, of this capacity, of what these capacity building things are, uh, is I think, I think a lot of it is these five-year cycles. Um, I desperately would love one day to write a book on how log frames have ruined the world. Uh, <laughs> in a lot of ways in terms of how it's changed There's some how good forest-based puns there. Right? I know, it'll be great. It's the only reason I want to write it. Yeah. Um, so some of it is this five-year cycle that's complicated by the fact that this is local and context-specific. So what is an ecosystem service of value to a community? Uh, I think this is Mexico I took this. Uh, is going to be very different what they value and what they would be willing to accept a payment for to protect than in the Congo Basin. And, and I think that's a big driver of why there is a huge supply of these capacity building projects going out that then don't really seem to add up to things because their applicability across scales or across countries is going to be limited. You know, you do have 
like countries in that if you're all in the Congo Basin, you know, maybe you could share some lessons and that might be applicable, but you probably can't take that out to the Amazon. Um, so that is part of it that, you know, I joked before and said there's a big supply, but there's no demand for these toolkits. In that case, there is a lot of demand because everything is, is local and context specific. Uh, and a limited pot of money that has to be spent by the end of the <coughs> fiscal year uh, that then means let's get this report out so we can show this project's done. Um, and so some of that follow-up, <coughs> and this, is, this goes into why we're looking at actors' reflexivity and learning and, and how they're trying to draw these connections, um, is asking, okay, so what did you do with this report? Uh, great, you looked at pollination. Pollination happens in more than one place in the world. Maybe other people are interested in pollination. Uh, and, and seeing if they're trying to build the sort of reflexive. That, that's one of the angles we're trying to get at. It's, but these are big bureaucracies, so that's interesting. Um, so I think that is part of it, and, and we do need to do that in the data. I think we draw some of those, those links. And you could even, dis even disaggregate the type, like even disciplinarily, because yeah. I suspect the economists and some of the non you know, the field staff are going to be, it's going to be capacity about like, how do we put economic value on this more than, uh, you know, what the foresters, the economists, or the, you know, biologists are more involved with, so that could be part of community or local communities. You know, so, yeah, yeah, just to, even to tease it apart on that level, it yeah. might be even more. Of Maybe my target audience might work. Yeah. Like, is this yeah, capacity this building for local communities? Is it for science? Is it for local scientists? Is it for regional decision or, or national or, or heck is this all for the donor to tell the donor here's how you can spend your money more wisely yeah that's actually a great idea thank you are there uh, other questions and um, yeah it's good to introduce ourselves as, as we ask questions as well just so we can uh, build the network and get to know each other better you have some other thoughts oh no please Oh, yeah, it's, it's, my name is Geneviève Bixi and I work for the National Capital Commission. Um, we've completed in partnership with University of Quebec on Terre and Jérôme Duprois and David Suzuki a study to evaluate the ecosystem services value of our new spaces in the region. It's a very local applied <coughs> study. But my challenge, like I'm, you know, we're renewing our sustainable development strategy, but our challenge, and I don't want to talk for upper management, but at my level, is how do we influence decision making and how do we create awareness not only of our you know internal you know decision makers but also how do we work in partnerships with federal other federal departments you know municipalities uh, where like there's a lot of tension in the region uh, on our green spaces so I find it like I, I found this question very interesting and it's not like it's, it's more than a comment than a question I find it's very um, I, I would tend to support your comments, like ecosystem services valua valuation and like how it's applied is very local. I think you know the municipal um, natural assets initiative uh, is very interesting, and I think like you know the uh, city of Gibson, <coughs> Gibson and, and, and British Columbia, like there's very nice pilot project coming out uh, with smart prosperity too. So I'm, I'm it's more common, and I'm, I'm just I find it very <coughs> interesting. But the challenges is. Yes, once you have studied the value, mm -hmm. what is, so what, you know, what, what is next? And I think this is very challenging, and you've said it, like, I think it's how do you increase awareness through silos to, you know, make better decision and actually include what is the real value of ecosystem services and decision making, regardless of the, a new world, world being built or, you know, making the citizen understand, like, the value of this forest against, like, a urban development project or so it's 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 quite quite challenging yeah yeah the, the municipal uh manning municipal assets natural asset natural initiative, natural assets yeah. initiative is really interesting because they're focusing on infrastructure so there's a huge infrastructure gap and and the interesting angle they're taking is saying well there's infrastructure all around us you yeah. know storm water can be provided by natural ecosystems as well as by a huge built environment uh, and so it's, it's an interesting idea and, and something that municipalities, because of this infrastructure gap, are really keen to hear. And so maybe that's part of the, 
getting sort of the ear of someone that might want to listen to your evaluation study is, mm -hmm. this is something you already really care about, you already have a gap or a deficit around. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe that's the trick, you know, like anything else, is finding that, that opportunity or that entry point. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, because this, this type of language was supposed to be sort of a unifying thing, right? So it wouldn't be like us greenies just trying to make the case, like, isn't it pretty? Let's preserve this. It was, you know, the whole idea was we can speak to policymakers and the corporations on their own terms and say, this is about business. Uh, we can save money to the public account, or we can help improve your bottom line. And that's what this was supposed to be doing. Um, and I'm not sure that it that it really has realized that yet, but maybe at, at some local levels it has. I just wanted to add a bit to that. It's like uh, economic economic data exists to make decisions about <coughs> scarce resources and trade-offs, and that's exactly what it is. So it has to be proven valuable to decision makers. So are there examples of where it has been in use? I know that I I did a paper a million years ago about deep. Uh, accounting being used in the Philippines for forestry. And so that was a one <clears throat> one where they evaluated that the you know the value of retaining it was, was more than you know turning it into pulp, which is what they're doing with a lot of the forests in Australia here, just shipping it off to like Japan and make paper, which is ludicrous. But um, an example that just came to mind there, we're we're spent and infrastructure projects is a perfect example. Uh, I did a paper on combined sewage uh, you know, the flush gate in Montreal a few years ago, where like all this, uh, you know, raw sewage was dumped into the, uh, into the, uh, the Saint Laurent. And here we've had the same problems with, we have combined sewage here, climate change, higher volatility, precipitation. So they're building like this major infrastructure project to put in a, um, like a sewage storage tanks under the, under the city, massive, massive investment. But there could be, you know, like, wetlands regrowth uh, initiatives, or there's another thing in the States, came out of the States, it's actually originally from Switzerland, called daylighting, where they look at like how before the city was, you know, was, was covered in bitumen and pavement, that there used to be natural flow to water, like out of the, out of the city, and how to, you know, how, allow the rainwater to naturally, so daylighting is like daylighting underground streams, to so bring them back up to the front, uh, above the surface, and reducing the amount of pavement in cities. I mean, I can't believe how many parking lots we have <clears throat> in our cities. It's just ridiculous, but, uh, you know, in front of these big malls. And um, so is there, is there, are there some examples? And how do we keep, the, my second part is, how do we keep it optimistic? So mm -hmm. it has to be useful to, like, decision makers, mm -hmm. and it has to be optimistic, uh, because right now I think economic decision makers, that's why business is 3% in that slide, is they see this all as a loss. They see you just telling them, declining, declining value of things. Uh, this is not, you know, I'm going to have to pay damages uh, for, you know, for the reduction in ecosystem services or all losing, you know, is this, it all, this, this risk aversion, they don't want to be told about the losses. They want to be told about these, you know, future, uh, it, you know, initiatives. And I don't know anything other than this, the stuff I've written the papers on, but the infrastructure is a, is a big thing. Like just like the sewage systems that we have are like 200 years old. The technology, you know, it's, and uh, it's hard to imagine that we're still literally shitting in the in the river. Like every every time there's a heavy heavy uh, <laughs> waterfall. Sorry, sorry to use the language there, but it's. I mean, it's uh, as we're as we're exchanging. Uh, how do you know, we keep it positive, and how do we give it like give it some like you know like punch mm -hmm. for the decision makers because they're. Because there's a lot of there's the capital invested in, in things is huge, right? And so, I mean, these are the, I mean, there's a lot of nature enthusiasts. There's a lot of these networks of people that want to get involved, want to do things about it, and they're interested in it, but they don't. They're not the powerful decision makers. So how do we, you know, get them? The, you know, the uh, just uh, just a reminder to introduce yourself because you're talking oh, about the papers. Oh, sorry, you're sorry about that. Yeah, yourself. Rob Nicole, yeah. uh, uh, concerned person, uh, student of the masters of public uh, and international affairs, did a master's in environment a while ago. I was at the Natural <coughs> Capital uh, presentation. I'm a member of a local uh, sustainable communities uh, charity. So, thank you. Yeah, just concerned <coughs> citizen. <laughs> would be a better title. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and I think it's it's about finding. I mean, I keep you know joking about yet another toolkit, uh, but that is actually a value of the toolkits is that they can be used. Like anyone can download the federal government's toolkit, and you know potentially at least use some of the things in there. Uh, and so that I think is useful, but it's also finding the thing that the business or the municipality or the provincial government or the federal government really wants to work on. Um, and so for an increasing number of countries right now, that's climate adaptation, ecosystem-based climate adaptation. Plant mangroves and help reduce losses to flooding and storms and monsoons. My mangroves won't uh, grow here, but... Well, okay, you know, that's not uh, but, but, specific but, you know, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. That's a very, you know, salient uh, example. Yeah. Uh, um, or here, you know, don't pave over the green belt because we need some lungs in Ontario. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that might be an example where some of this valuation did actually help <laughs> because farmers were making very real decisions about their retirement, and. You know, there's not a lot of people that want to be a farmer these days. Well, there's some hipsters that want to take it back up, I guess. Um, but then it's artisanal, and um, I can joke. I'm used to living there for some hipsters. Uh, so, if you're a farmer, you're looking at nobody wants to buy my farm. I need to have a retirement. These developers will take it and pay my future. Right? So, but then the result is all of these individual farmers come to this very rational conclusion that makes sense for any of us looking at retirement, but the result of all of them making that individual decision is we've paved over something like the green belts. Or fracking, <coughs> or fracking's gone wild and... Yeah, and so you could look at, yeah. you know, the biggest risk from fracking, as I learned in an IPEN talk two weeks ago, water uh, is water on the surface. So it's not the underground water, it's surface water. And that we can quantify and look at what is actually the cost. Um, and, you know, business is 3% here, but some of the best PEZ schemes that, uh, that I've been finding are being done by businesses at a very local level. So Nestle Vitel has something that people are calling the perfect PEZ scheme. They're working with, I think it's a... Uh, 19 to 25 farmers <coughs> in the Vittel region in northeastern France because it's in Nestle's interest to make sure that water is at a certain quality at all times. You know, they have a million or billion dollar brand of Nestle Vittel water and it comes from that place and tastes a certain way. Um, so they have a lot invested in that. And so they, they're paying the farmers to use alternative techniques from their dairy farms to prevent uh, nitrates and other pollutants getting into the water that could then ruin the quality of the water. They've set up an ombudsman off, uh, office so the farmers don't have to negotiate with the big bad company. Uh, they review the quality of the payments and the amount of money that they provide on an annual, or not annual, but on a regular basis. And they look at the opportunity cost. What would the farmers have made if they had done the farming techniques that they probably would have implemented if this PEZ scheme didn't exist. And that is the value that they put on it. And so it's an interesting case of hitting a business where it matters. And increasingly, I think we're seeing some of these big box brands uh, care about quality, which means maybe you get your coffee beans from more than one place in the world because you need to assure a certain standard, whether they're coming from Mexico or Ethiopia. Um, and so these are all for rational bottom line reasons, not out of the goodness of their hearts. But you could see where starting to care about ecosystem services might actually matter uh, to because they are risk adverse and because we're living in an age of climate change that increases their risk to vulnerabilities in, in the ecosystems on which they depend. So it'll be interesting to see actually, uh, I think maybe the business case might be becoming stronger for businesses to start to care. That's my optimistic spin. Do we have another? Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Um, I didn't introduce myself the first time. Peter Morris, and I'm formerly with the uh, Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development, and now doing graduate courses at uh, RU in Um There's another aspect to the sort of international side of things, which I think 
you might find worth thinking about if you haven't already, which is the extent to which the idea of ecosystem services has been a bridge between uh, ecologists and economists. Um, and I'm doing courses in both of those areas at the moment, so I, I'm interested in this, in this topic for that reason. But what you're seeing on the ecology side is an increasing awareness of the importance of trying to quantify and understand what exactly those ecosystem services are, uh, who exactly is benefiting, and what are the biological and ecological conditions that will, will be best able to promote or enhance those kinds of services. So if you look at the, I haven't done the analysis, but my impression is that uh, from a qualitative basis, if you look at what's happening in the ecological literature, <coughs> that there's been a, a tremendous growth, and I think it's a continuing growth in the use of that idea in an attempt to try and understand um, the linkages between humans and, and the rest of the ecosystems mm -hmm. using this kind of a framework as, a, as an approach. Yeah, I know some people in the project team uh, on that first work package have done some citation tracing and mapping and things like that. Um, I would leave it to them to answer, and I, I'm happy to put you in touch. They even have a draft paper that they might threaten to send you. Um, so yeah, if, if you like, I could put you in touch with them, because that's exactly the types of things that they're trying to tease out, is what groups are, you know, is it a bridge, and, and what groups are speaking to each other in disciplinary terms. Okay, some follow-up there outside of the, uh, <coughs> in the room, that's good. that's good. Do you have some more uh, questions or comments? Another. Oh, sorry, one about uh, network uh, network theory and that. And I've just been reading a lot about the power of digital platforms and just the, you know, this, uh, <coughs> and everybody being really concerned about the monopolistic or oligopolistic uh, powers of things. Like Nestle's a total, like, oligopoly controls. They have, like, 40% of the goods that are in the, in the average supermarket are owned by Nestle, right? <coughs> So they're huge, huge. Uh, so the power of these these platforms to like, uh, you know, to engage and, and raise awareness of things is there, like how how could we find some way to to harness you know that because I know working with the, with grassroots community charities and things like that, everybody wants to reach out to other people and share this knowledge and get momentum on this, but there's like it's very difficult to link up. In that sense, so is there any, you know, is there any thoughts about like, a, like a platform to like get to that implementation kind of stage uh, more to get like, <coughs> information into the hands of the decision makers, uh, you know, by broadcast, by <coughs> other, you know, just by sheer volume of, <laughs> of messaging, you know. Yeah, it's always tough with the digital stuff. Like I, uh, I date myself when I say this is like field of dreams. If you build it, maybe they actually won't come. Um, or I guess it's the opposite of the field of dreams. And then there's these quiet because they have no idea. They're giving me the look Xavier's giving me right now. But they have no idea what this movie is. Um, so it's, I mean, the digital space is fascinating, and I know scholars have done uh, a lot of work on on how do you broadcast out and get people to listen. Um, you know, in terms of market structure and things like that, uh, Peter DeVern and Jane Lister have done a lot on the power of Walmart and some of these box, like these big box stores to actually, because <coughs> of where they are in the supply chain, they have enormous power. Even over companies like Levi, you know, jeans, they can enforce sustainability <coughs> standards saying, if you would like to put your clothing on Walmart shelves, which we're pretty sure you do, uh, you have to meet certain sustainability standards. And that's not necessarily out of Walmart's you know, generous heart. It's that they want to make sure that there's quality products going on at a certain price, and that will meet their branding and their needs. Uh, so they're using green standards as a way to ensure that. Isn't that mostly as a result of eco activism and and like like Greenpeace and other organizations targeting the big the bigger companies and and like eco shaming them into improving their practices? Like I know that with H and M and with uh, even like locally Joe Fresh and you know Bangladesh and all that stuff that these these uh, more of that with human rights, but H and M also the like 
the chemicals in the production. I mean, there's, it's tied in, you know, the human rights and the, chemi and the environmental the damage of that, and also the, you know, the volume of clothing that <coughs> discard and that sort of thing. That it's <coughs> that it's not a result of the benevolent actions of these corporations, but rather um, it's the result of, of activism. And so that that's what I'm saying is like, is there a way to like activate these the, this, these these programs, implement them? have them have like an impact on decision making through some sort of a, a network, a coalition, I mean, yeah. without necessarily going to that militant, you know, like putting, flat, you know, banners on nuclear reactors or ramming whaling ships, but, you know, like to get into the, into the, you know, in front of the decision makers through yeah. something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's interesting. So, Greenpeace, their strategy is generally I, I, to choose one company and then just hammer it that one company. Yeah. Until they turn, and then they turn to say Joe Fresh and say, well, look what H&M just did. Yeah. Why can't you do it if they can do this? Exactly. And then that's that's their strategy for turning a market. So maybe like, that's what we need to do. Um, in this, in this yeah, and it's, you know, it's this old debate with activist strategies. Are you an insider or an outsider? Do you work with the decision makers to kind of try to move them along? And I think ecosystem services is, is kind of an insider <coughs> tool. You know, you want to sit at the at the table with the decision makers and say, look, okay, you know, uh, Dave Suzuki Foundation wants to sit there and say, Site C Dam is going to flood agricultural land that is worth this many billions of dollars to BC's economy. That's the case that they want to make. And that's an insider sort of play ball tactic. Greenpeace uh, has a very different strategy on Site C Dam. Uh, that does not involve a boardroom unless it's being thrown, I guess. Um, and I don't know if this language would work for that kind of a protest-based strategy. I mean, you can't imagine the billboard would have to be like this long <laughs> just to get the zeros on, sort of. Maybe that actually be really effective. Um, so, so this is sort of, I mean, I'm just trying to imagine if I was an NGO trying to start something up. This kind of language, I think, would really work as an insider tactic. Well, I'm not advocating necessarily the militant strategy. Fun but, you know, you know. My, my wife works at WWF, and I and I hear some of the insider like politics stuff, and they are very limited, as you as you <coughs> correctly uh, you know identified in your in your, so with with the amount of with their agenda because it's political because their donors are coming from certain spaces mm -hmm. from from some countries, and then the activities are in other countries. There, there's like you know multilateral agreements in a lot of the spaces mm -hmm. that they work in, and so there's you know so by the time that the the, the actual you know actions are taken, they're generally you know diluted uh, to to a state that's you know palatable to a number of other to all parties involved, and so that's the you know that's that's one of the big challenges then is is when you're on the inside then you're then you're uh, you know constrained by all those other forces, right? Yeah. So, yeah, but, and, we have time for two more. I know you did have your hand up a couple, a couple of times. Yeah, Do you want to speak again? Like filling the silence. Um, <laughs> to introduce myself, my name is Aviva Silberg. I'm doing my PhD at the University of Waterloo, but I live here, so here I am. Um, my question is going back to uh, capacity building. I think that's really interesting to me that there's so much work happening in that area, but it just raises a whole bunch of new questions. So it would be really interesting to see the results of your work as you delve down deeper, because um, the questions that were popping up to me were, to what extent are these things doubling up for other priorities that they can label it as capacity building for ecosystem services, but then also it's just straight up development support as well, or there's like a political or diplomatic element to it. And then the other thing that I was wondering is the timelines associated with capacity building. So agreed, at the beginning you need capacity building, but then is there an exit strategy associated for it? Or does it just become part of the like core <coughs> base budget support for a lot of these partners and that if you withdraw that money then it, it pulls the plug on all work in that area. And then with governments that have limited budgets, like there's no room to really spend in new areas because you're still kind of committed in these old areas. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, unpacking that more um, could help 
identify some really helpful insights that can help to move your work forward in terms of um, getting uptake. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point, especially I remember thinking back to RED. Uh, a lot of the early pilot projects to see if RED could work as a results-based payment were, and you looked at who was doing those early pilot projects, WWF, Nature Conservancy, and then you look at actually where those were, and it's where they already were working. They already had, you know, a protected area there that was suddenly going to become a red pilot project. Um, they already were active in that region, and maybe they're just going to expand it a little bit. Um, so that might be the case exactly that, you know, maybe there's already an agricultural extension project happening there that they can say, oh, well, now we're looking at soil fertility as an ecosystem service. Um, that's very likely. Um, I'd also like to dig in a bit. Uh, to see where, like, are some countries getting a ton of this capacity building support? Um, again, thinking of RED, India was getting a ton of RED support. India was is a bad RED case. Like, it's not a good country to be doing RED in, just because of how its forest management has historically developed in the yeah. state of its forests. Um, so it was never going to be a good idea. Meanwhile, you know, Ecuador, that has huge potential, was getting very little. Um, so I think that's a great great idea to as a way to kind of parse out this capacity building. Um, and then I had another idea that I told you as well. So, you keep talking about red. Sorry to like I'm so sorry. Yeah, 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 like, short short point. Yeah, to finish my up. point yeah. is um, I did some work in the Philippines and it was mm -hmm. this like nightmare story about red where it was this like community and they got tricked into having their like ancestral, like, high cultural value forest, and then a company paid for it and then transformed it into a plantation. And oh, it's still technically a forest, but it was like devastating for the community. So I think it would also be interesting to see what are the successes, but then also what are the failures associated and take like a hard look. <laughs> maybe we can maybe we can finish there in the interest of time. And I think some uh, some really interesting um, suggestions, you know, for the, the way forward. And uh, I just want to uh, thank, especially the people who came from uh, off campus or from outside. You know, it's uh, you're very welcome wherever wherever you're affiliated, and uh, it's great to have uh, different perspectives. Uh, and also, again, uh, thank Dr. Allen. I think this is a very uh, kind of multi-dimensional topic, it takes you in all kinds of directions from, you know, Coca-Cola to Nestle to uh, to uh, the secret economy of uh, soil, biota, and all these kinds of things. So well done for handling so many uh, <laughs> questions on so many different aspects of it. So uh, we'll finish with a round of applause. Do uh, also um, tuck in the remaining sandwiches, especially you, because you haven't had a chance to eat yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm surprised you can't <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation.